Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective, and today I have kind of a double treat for you here. As you saw in the video title, this is on the ThinkPad T450 series, and by a stretch of fates and good fortune, I have not one, but two of these models for us to take a look at today. So the T450 was announced in January of 2015, and it was the long-awaited answer for many people that took issue with the T440's design, in particularly the less-than-ideal click pad that was on the previous model. If you would like to see more information about the T440 and the other issues that that sort of series trackpad had, I'll leave a link to a machine from that time period up in the top right hand corner for you to examine. Let's go ahead and work through some of the updates that happened between the T440 and T450 design. The primary difference was a new series of CPUs and GPUs were made available on these units, but there was another change that happened in the background that many ThinkPad enthusiasts today still consider to be very controversial and that is, of course, the soldered-on CPU in the T-Series line. The T440 was the last ThinkPad T-Series that had a socketed CPU that allowed you to swap out the chip. On these, they're all soldered on the board from the factory, so whatever you want, you need to make sure that you are purchasing um, moving forward. Thankfully, RAM is still socketed, so there is room for upgradability. The T450 came with an interesting series of CPUs. You were able to get this with a previous generation Intel CPU, the i5-4300, but it was also more commonly available in the i3 and i5 and i7 of the, five, or the fifth generation Intel series. So you could either get the i3-510U, the i5-5200U or 5300U, by the way, both of these are 5300Us. Or you could also get it in the i7-5500U or 5600U. Depending on which one of those CPUs that you got, you would either be rocking the Intel uh, 44000 uh, or the 5500, or in some cases, they would come bundled with the GeForce 940M. All the displays on the T450 were a 14 inch variety and there were essentially four primary uh, options that these panels came in and they're pretty easy to identify in some cases. The first is the classic 1368 by 768 uh, TN panel which is not desirable really. The second option up which is actually this one you see here is the 1600 by 900 panel. And then it also came in a 1920 by 1080 IPS display. And then in some instances, there was even a 920 by 1080 touch panel. And these are very easy to distinguish between the other models simply because of the, well, the entire top case is different uh, in every way. There's a very easy way to tell at a glance if you're looking at kind of the top tier panel. The first is, is that the bezels are entirely different. There is no exterior trim like you see on the lower end model displays. And it is also considerably thicker in terms of uh, your, front, uh, your front case here. And because of that, swapping these panels means that you're swapping the entire top deck. So just be aware of that. It's not simply a go in and change out the panel. There is going to be a lot more to it than that, especially if you want to maintain that touch compatibility. Let's talk about some other specifications. RAM, for example, in this was pretty standard PC3, uh, 12,800, 1600 megahertz of RAM. Came with two slots. Lenovo said that it would officially support up to 16 gigs of RAM with two sticks of eight. However, the enthusiast community has found out that if you have two uh, two sticks of 16, you're going to be able to get 32 gigs of RAM in one of these, so plenty of RAM even for running virtual machines on the go. For hard drive configurations, we have a 2.5 inch bay in either one, as well as an M.2 42mm drive slot uh, as well if you're not using the WAN card. If your machine came without uh, the smart card reader, there will be a third M.2 slot, but it will only accept one-sided drives. So if there's anything on the other side of the chipset, it won't fit in that slot. In terms of batteries, there were essentially uh, 
several different configurations. Regardless of which model you purchased, it did come with a 23 watt hour internal battery. Then you could get either a 23 watt hour external, a 48 watt external, or a 72 watt hour external battery. So lots of options, and because you have that battery bridge system on the inside, you could swap those batteries while the machine was still on, presuming that you had charge in the internal battery. As you can see on uh, these keyboards here, there were several optional features. For example, over on this one, we have it sporting the, the backlit keyboard as well as the fingerprint reader. However, over here, both of those options are entirely absent. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and tour the ports of this machine. We're actually going to start on the bottom here because the dock connector is worth talking about. This is only featured on the models that contain Intel chipsets. If you have an NVIDIA card in here, this is oddly absent, probably just due to space and where it is on the board. So if you turn one of these machines over and you don't see that, you've got a high probability of an NVIDIA chipset being on board. Just a fast way of being able to physically identify uh, if this is here or not. Starting on the right hand side, we have the Kensington lock slot, VGA, gigabit ethernet, USB 3.0 super speed, as well as the uh, SD card slot and the SIM card slot. You've also got a headphone microphone combo jack. On the other side, on both of these models, they are equipped with the smart card reader. We do have the USB 3.0 uh, super speed always on charging port, mini display port, the CPU exhaust fan, another USB 3.0 super speed port, and then the rectangular standard Lenovo charging port. Let's quickly go ahead and disassemble one of these and just see what is inside, what is upgradable and serviceable, and then we will talk about a few other things. So the very first thing that you need to do is actually go into the BIOS and disable the internal battery, which I've gone ahead and done already. And then the second thing that we're gonna have to do is of course remove this smaller battery up here. And that requires both of the tabs being pulled off to the side and then the battery being slid out. And as you can see, this is the super thin 24 watt hour option. To remove this case, we have a series of screws all around the edge and we can actually see the keyboard drain holes as well, which is a good feature that is uh, really great to see that was retained on this model. So once all these screws have been removed, you can go ahead and take your favorite pry tool and just begin to encourage the uh, case to pop off. It is worth noting that when you are removing this, you want to be especially careful around the CPU vent area. This area, if uh, it goes underneath any significant stress while removing that case, uh, could potentially snap. So you just want to be mindful of that. Everything else is uh, pretty, pretty robust and well manufactured. Okay, so now that we're on the inside, we can pretty much see everything that there is to service, and it's all underneath these beautifully uh, engineered uh, moisture resistant shields. So under here we have our two RAM slots. This is currently occupied by one stick of 8 gigs of RAM and it leaves the other one open so if we want to expand that to 16 or swap them out for the 32. Over here under this shield we have not only the Wi-Fi card but it looks like we actually have a WAN card present as well. Now, depending on which model and which region you're in, those cards will vary. And then this one, of course, can be swapped out for a standard M.2 42mm SATA drive. Moving right along, we do have the uh, CMOS battery for quick and easy access, as well as all the connectors that we would expect to find. Our 2.5 inch drive bay is down here, and that is currently being occupied by a 1 terabyte drive, which is very nice. And then we have our internal battery hanging out over here. And this is a 23 watt hour internal battery. More or less everything that you would need to service with the exception of the keyboard and trackpad, and we'll talk about those in a minute, can be accessed down here. So very quickly I'm going to show you the process of removing the keyboard. 
Uh, but to do that, I am going to just quickly reassemble this case um, as we've pretty much seen all the major serviceable components. As you can see, it's pretty well packed in here. So for the keyboard removal process, there are two rubber stoppers just underneath the battery compartment. And it might not seem like these are actually integral to the process, um, but you will find it very difficult to actually remove the keyboard or with these in place. So once those are removed, we can flip the machine back over, open up the keyboard deck, take a flathead screwdriver, and move these two tabs upward to reveal all the screws that we're going to need to remove this. And they are located in the following places. One is above the left control key. One is located above the S key. One is located above the J key. One is located above the uh, semicolon key. One is located above the up arrow key. And one screw is located above the F key. Now once those screws are loosened, we're going to flip the keyboard deck over like so. And the cable is actually attached on the other side uh, for us to unplug it. But as you can see, removing the keyboard is not that difficult at all. All right, now that we have it reassembled, let's go ahead and turn these on. And you can see exactly uh, what they look like and how they perform. We are going to put the one with the touch panel front and center. And we'll also start up our backlit keyboard non-touch example as well. But as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, both of these machines are fantastic in their own right. And they would make a lovely addition to anyone needing a decent workhorse with lots of battery power with much, much life to give. Currently, if you want to go high-end, these machines vary in price from as high as $500 Canadian. And there are also some S variants that start as low as $350. So if you're watching local classifieds or eBay or whatever, then you'll see these uh, vary a fair degree in price. And they're only going to go down in price because these machines are just coming off of the longest uh, warranties that Lenovo offers. So there's lots of businesses liquidating these in 2020, making them an excellent contender, very similar to the X1 Carbon 3rd generation. At any rate, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoy this sort of content and would like to see more, I would suggest that you do the big four here at the bottom. Please like the video, share, subscribe and hit that notification bell so when a ThinkPad shows up on this channel or when two ThinkPads show up on this channel, you'll be the first to know about it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.